You've all probably heard of the word gerontology, but what exactly is it? My name is Charles Bedord, and I invite all of you to join my guest and me to learn about gerontology and a new and innovative way of applying this field of study. My guest today is Marguerite de Lange. Marguerite earned a master's degree in gerontology and currently teaches gerontology courses at both San Francisco State University and Foothill Community College in Los Altos. Welcome, Marguerite. It's great to have you on the show. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Thank you for having me here, Chuck. And um, what a dangerous question to ask me, because <laughs> how much time can Open I take? Open-ended. No, <laughs> Open <feel free>. <laughs> yeah. I was born and raised in the Netherlands. Okay. Then when my husband and I got married, we moved to Germany. And after living there, we moved to the U.S. First to the state of Oregon, oh, and I then see. to California. I decided to go back to school myself and study first psychology and then gerontology. Interesting. Yeah, but so, let me, uh, another yes. thing about myself, I think, you know, that describes myself a little bit more is that I strongly value family and friendships and relationships in the wider community. Well, that's certainly very important because uh, I'm from the Midwest myself and uh, I, I kind of feel sometimes that uh, people don't know each other as well as they really should perhaps in, you know, in California as they do in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And friendships are, are certainly extremely important and it yeah. takes a long time to build those up sometimes. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. So you are a gerontologist. Uh, can you tell our audience what exactly is a gerontologist? Yeah, gerontology. <laughs> gerontologist, right? <laughs> right. I, I don't want to spell with a gerontologist. No, uh, no, it is the gerontologist. Uh, sometimes people know more about a geriatric because we have now geriatric doctors. These are medical doctors that are specialized in the illnesses and diseases of the aging population. A gerontologist looks at the social and psychological and maybe some of the biomedical, the changes that come with aging uh, in the process of aging. So it's the psychological and social aspects. Now when people become a gerontologist, they have a, a plethora of, of uh, areas where they can work and people choose to work in the area that fits them best. That could be uh, maybe uh, advocating, uh, lobbying, it could be geriatric management, mm -hmm. working with the elderly directly. In my case, it's teaching. I teach at San Francisco State University on topics like aging, but also in my case, it is leading story groups. Now, how far along, oh, well, to take me back just a little bit, when did the word gerontologist come into uh, common usage? I mean, it, it seems like it's, when I was in college, it sounds like it was almost kind of an outgrowth of sociology or psychology. And, and some people still think that way, you mm -hmm. know, they think, is it not a, a, a sub-discipline mm -hmm. under sociology or psychology and no it is its own discipline and I know that the program at San Francisco State University the master's program was founded 35 years ago okay even though the field of gerontology is older but the interesting part is that um, we know and most people know that right now the aging population is growing right growing very the baby fast boomers. the baby boomers born uh, between 46 and 64 right now and for many years to come are turning 65 one person every seven minutes. Wow. So think that's about amazing. that. You blink, Chuck, <laughs> and somebody else uh -huh. has turned 65. So this population is growing to <clears throat> where we will soon have about 20 to 25 percent of the population being 65 and older. Well, think about that. So in the past, um, people didn't live this long. In right. the last century, we actually have added 
30 years to the life experience. That is amazing when you think about it. It really right, is. Yes. Right. So when we started the study of gerontology and looking at all the people, at the beginning, you know who they studied? They went to a nursing home and studied all the people there. Right. So the, the focus was more on the problems of aging. Sickness. And Sickness yes. and so. Later we became wiser and we focused from problems to possibilities. Good. And that was good. Possibilities, stay active, stay engaged. Now we look at potential. And the beauty of that is that when there's potential, there's potential for growth, for development. That's right. It, it's like your life doesn't stop at 65. Not at all. You can still start. Uh, you can start your own business. You can start new adventures. Start oh, new, yeah. new new parts of your oh, life. Oh yeah, yeah. We call that the encore. <laughs> yeah. Now, but besides uh, uh, teaching gerontology, I understand you are also the founder and director of a group called Stories Unfolding. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what is Stories Unfolding? Yeah. Yeah, maybe I'll go back to, I told you that I moved from Europe to the US. Okay. And then we moved to California and you talked about it yourself. People are busy here. What I noticed was that um, I saw my neighbors coming home in their cars and automatically have their garage doors opened and they disappeared. You know, you touched on something that's very sensitive to me. I've often felt that one of the great uh, destroyers of a neighborhood is the automatic garage door opener. Oh, we should Basically, do something about that. If you didn't that. get to talk to your neighbor any other time during the day, you got to see him when they get, had to get out of the car and lift the garage door. Yeah. And now, of course, that's gone. But yeah. Anyhow, that's just yeah. a personal note. No, it is. It is. There's no front porch anymore. <laughs> that's right. Right? That's so right. at first, it was the other people that were so busy, but it didn't take long till I was, you know, that same person. We are busy here in California. Very involved. We do get to know a lot of people, at least mm -hmm. that was my personal experience. But how well do I get to know my neighbors? Right. How well and how deep are my friendships? So I felt there was something missing. And that's what prompted me, along with my study of gerontology, there was one important thing that I'd like to tell you, that um, when you study aging, you also look at seniors who are isolated. Right. And isolation, we now know, is more detrimental to your health than smoking. Isolation is really not mm -hmm. good for our well-being. So the combination of seeing people too busy to connect and knowing the, 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 how hard and how bad it is for our well-being and health to be isolated, I came up with this idea to bring people together to help them connect. And what better way to connect than through stories? Okay. And that's why I called this organization that I founded now 15 years ago, I think, mm -hmm. Stories Unfolding. It's interesting because uh, I talked to a friend of mine uh, recently who lives in the Chicago area, and uh, his son had been trying to, to get them to move to Kentucky. He says, well, you can always make new friends down here in Kentucky. You know, you, you don't have to stay with your old friends. And uh, she said, well, one of the problems with trying to make new friends is that they are just new friends, that they don't know the story behind the friendship. Yeah. yeah. You know, they, they, they don't know the back scene stories. That's yeah. the way they went along with it. Yeah. So uh, tell me, what is uh, Stories Unfolding? What do you do there? Yeah. So it is an organization that offers a variety of services, but I'd, I'd like to tell about one sure. service that is the one that is being used the most. So what we do is we offer live review groups okay. or what we call guided autobiography groups. Now, live review is, uh, is a term that was coined by um, actually a long time ago by a gerontologist, psychiatrist, Dr. Robert Butler. And this was in 1963 when he wrote a landmark paper because he as a psychiatrist had to diagnose people who would incessantly talk about when I was young, uh, when I was little, and always the same story and the story over and over. And do you know how they diagnosed that in the past? That was called senility. 
Oh, really? And Dr. D Butler said, this is not senility. This is life review. And it is something that occurs automatically. And I looked it up yesterday. I looked up at his paper, so I wrote it down. So if you allow me to read sure, what he said in this paper, he said, talking and reflecting about the past is a naturally occurring. So it, it just, it comes. Universal mental process involving the progressive recall of past experiences, and particularly the resurgence of unresolved conflicts. So what he's saying is that we do have that naturally occurring memory of stories, and we want to talk about that, and we want to process that. And in processing, we resolve unresolved issues. So it is a looking back process, which actually is set in motion by looking forward to death. So it's not seeing something in his eyes, is not seeing something that's abnormal or pathological. Exactly, not at all. It's something that is necessary. And why is it necessary? Because we need to make sense out of it. We have lived a long life, and you wonder why do certain memories come up? I mean, you've lived your whole life, and when you start talking with your friend and you remember something, right. how come you remember that particular thing? If you pay attention to what stories do you tell, where, where are they coming from? They all have some meaning. So we want to recall them and we want to um, interpret them. What do they mean? Because it might be that we have stories about something that happened when we were a young child. Let's say your parents got divorced. And you often, because you were not happy with the decisions that they made for you, you'd say, I hate my parents, mm -hmm. okay? And now they get divorced. So what happens? You feel guilty. You think it's your fault. And then you cannot actually understand that at the level of development where you are. Right. But now that you're older, if you look back at that, you can say, wait a minute, I didn't even have that power. That was not me. I suppose another way of looking at it, too, is that you look back at certain experiences in your life, certain things that you did that kind of serve as landmarks to who you became eventually. That's what it is. Yeah. Yes, and say, you know, I, I feel this way now because this happened to me when, uh, or I, I used to do this as a child. Yeah, exactly. You know, so you're, that, you're a product of your past and your environment in that way. Um, not automatically a no. product, but your interpretation brings you to the product. So there's that self-development that at an older age, when we look back and say, who am I? I mean, are those the existential question? Who am I? Why mm -hmm. am I here? Not that we're going to solve them through life review, but it helps us to understand who we are. And it gives us a security and, 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 and an esteem of, of moving forward in the later years, which might not be so easy, mm -hmm. but because we've looked back and understand more and have celebrated ourselves mm -hmm. in a sense. Uh, we have also discovered adaptive strategies. How do we deal with things that come our mm -hmm. way? We've also learned that sometimes events are negative, I mean, at the moment. Mm -hmm. But later when we look back, we say, wow, because of this negative event, I had to move or I became the force, but look at who I became. So this is who I am, and with that I can move forward. Now you've used the term life review. Mm -hmm. I also heard you use the term guided autobiography. Yeah. Yeah. Is guided autobiography a subgroup within life review? Um, I don't know if we can say that, but it is, we use live review okay. in guided autobiography. And I'm glad you're asking because there's another person that I really, really uh, respect, um, and that is Dr. James Biron. He's not a gerontologist, uh, psychologist from long time ago who saw the importance for people to continue to develop as a human being right. and do that through life review, through storytelling. So he came up with the, the words guided autobiography, which means it is an autobiography, your story, that is being guided by a program 
guided autobiography, which is a semi-structured way mm -hmm. in helping you to recall and review and interpret and share your story. Now, I understand that you uh, have organized what you call guided autobiography or GAB groups. Yes, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about these, please? Yeah, yeah. So that was part of the Stories Unfolding organization that I offer GAB right. groups, in short. And what it is, I invite uh, at the moment, especially women, so let's focus on women. Right. Women live longer, but that's not <laughs> the, the only reason. Usually women are more interested in this work, but we can talk right. about that later. But So I bring together groups of women, ideally about eight women, and I bring them around the table in a comfortable setting, and we lay out the rules. The rules are confidentiality. Whatever mm -hmm. is being spoken here is not being carried out. Um, so that a trust level can, mm -hmm. can start to build. And then each week I will give these women, women a theme which I write down on a piece of paper. Some of them I've borrowed from Dr. James Barron. And al along with the theme, there are what we call priming or sensitizing questions. There are about 10 questions. Mm -hmm. So Chuck, you come home and you have this, this theme on your paper and, and it says, well, we're gonna, this week we're gonna think about your family life, for mm -hmm. example. And then there are questions. And these questions help you to suddenly recall. It primes you. Memories come. And I want you to sit with that for a few days. Just think about that. And then after that, you're invited to take a piece of paper and start writing what comes up and what you would like to write about. Okay. And then these women come back the next week, and each of them has written two pages. Not less, not more, ideally. And the idea is that there's not a random sharing where you kind of lose track of where mm -hmm. you're going. It's something that you've thought over and that you have written about. And now the women in the circle are taking turns to tell their story. That is such a powerful experience because suddenly the woman who has thought about this, who has written it down, is now reading it in her own voice. Right. Often it becomes emotional. Mm. They say, how come I become emotional? I, I, I didn't mm. have that when I wrote. No, but no, when you, the, the women, do you have kind of, a, do you have an age cutoff for this group? Or? It's not an age cutoff, okay. no, no. But it usually is for women uh, who are, I call them mature women, so maybe 55 and over. Okay. But I must tell you, I have women in their 40s, I have women in their 80s, a lot of women in their 70s. Do you have any men? I have had men, and I have, you know, <laughs> requests for men, and I invite you too, you know, to join one of those groups. But um, I, I prefer to have either women or, or men. men group, and not the mixture. And I've done mixture in the past; it works, but solely women groups or solely men groups. Oh, I see. So you find that, that I that, find that working better. Where, yeah. that, that works better. That's yeah. interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, now, how, how do you find your participants? Do they come to you? Do you recruit them? Or Yeah. I, I always wonder, where are these women come from? They come to me, Chuck. I'm sorry. <laughs> they come. I mean, magnet. I do a You're lot a magnet, of uh, yes. public, public speaking on this topic, too, and then people uh -huh. hear me. And I ask questions to people. I, I say, you know, when you think back somebody who's not there any longer and you would have a chance to ask a question to that person what would it be and i give some time to have mm -hmm. you think about that question and and a lot of people tell me when when i heard you speak here or here and you asked that question i realized you know i wish i could ask my dad about his war right. experience or my grandma and so and then i always say and you know it won't be too long that the next generation or the next is sitting i wish i would have asked her so what about writing down these right. life stories i know another technique i suppose you could use would be to uh a, 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 a re, to record an interview, just mm -hmm. sit down at the kitchen table and do a, a recording, ask questions and record the answers. Yeah, yeah. There is a difference between doing something spontaneously, right. which is good, and a little bit more structured when mm -hmm. you think about it and when you write it down. That thinking, that writing down, that reading out loud, and then the last part we haven't talked about is the other women are listening.
And listening to stories is so yeah. important. Now, do you, do you measure outcomes in this group of people? Do you uh, have any uh, output as far as if you're, uh, I'll call it therapy here for mm -hmm. want of a better mm -hmm. word off the top of my head, but is whether this is therapy, is it effective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so outcomes, we do have small researches that have been done through the Biographical Institute, through Dr. Behrens' earlier work, mm -hmm. and I can read you some of those. To me, what speaks loudest is the outcome that I see right away. I see women that come, and some of them maybe deal a little bit with depression, or some of them don't know exactly where they want to go. They kind of lost their their labels loosed, their, right. their will to, to live. I, I'm not saying that that's really what it is, but some people come and, and they realize, first of all, how therapeutic, not therapy, but therapeutic, how healing mm -hmm. it is to have other people be really... So take me to one of your sessions. What does this... Yeah, so if we were, were sitting here with six other women and I would read my story, you would not interrupt. At the end, you would not say, oh, I know what you're talking about, and you would go on with your story. No, you would give that person really space to be listened to. And um, then you would realize that her story or his story is really not that different from your story, even though the scenarios are quite different. Mm. But there's this universality in it that we all have gone through life and that there all were struggles and joys and challenges and 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 connections and misconnections yes. so there's a connection through that and yet when you when i hear your story i say wow he is unique mm -hmm. chuck is unique what mm -hmm. a special person and before when i didn't know your story by the way we do not only have stories we are our stories. Yeah. You were to me just Chuck, right. another man. Okay? Now I'm hearing your story. I feel connected. I can't help to feel connected. So what happens in the groups when you're there, you see a bonding, you see a love, you see a becoming a life, you see um, Sometimes women remember things that they used to like, <laughs> and suddenly they say, oh, I totally forgot about I used to, and then they will do it. Now, you have obviously have an awful lot of passion for this, I can tell <laughs> yeah. by the tone of your voice. Yeah. Uh, uh, what do you get out of this? Uh, what, what's the most satisfying part of this for you personally? Oh, Chuck, this is the highlight of my week. <laughs> and it's, it's the, every group meeting is the highlight, and not only for me, but to see other people grow and blossom and for them to say, I, I, the week is too long, I can't wait to be there. Uh, that to me is very fulfilling. So they can't wait to get back to your group, right? They can't right. wait to be back, yeah. yeah. Now I see yeah. you're wearing a blueberry listener button. Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what's that? a blueberry yeah. listener? Okay, uh, it has to be brief because that is a very long story, but it has to do with the power of listening. And I had a very close dear friend one time who had a terminal disease and I would spend time with her and I really practiced listening because that was the most important thing for her to, to do, to tell her story and to reflect and come to grips of who, who, who is she before this end of life is coming closer. And uh, we had met one time and had a wonderful time as she told me her stories. And then the next day she told me that she had reflected on that time and given me a nickname. Oh, and of really? course I was very curious. And while she was speaking with me um, to, to help her with her health issues, I'd, I'd offered her blueberries, which have antioxidants, oh, I and I just wanted to <laughs> do a little something. So her nickname for me was Blueberry Listening. Okay. And I thought that that was a wonderful way to help people wear a button and remember, become a blueberry listener. So okay. I would go out and invite people. As a matter of fact, I will invite you too. Oh, and thank you. I'll give you a blueberry listener button. Thank you very and, much. And uh, it reminds you to maybe talk a little less or keep that garage door open. And <laughs> That's meet right. With Get out of the car and open the garage. <laughs> and listen. And I have to do uh -huh. that too. But it is so powerful. Now, one yeah. other interesting thing that you had mentioned uh, to me uh, before the show was that you've been 
uh, recruited by the Stanford University School of Medicine yeah. to participate in a research study. Yeah. Can you tell us, tell us a, a little bit about that study. Okay. Yeah, that was a couple of years ago. I don't know. I think there was one participant who worked at the hospital, told the doctor, but somehow um, there was a doctor here at Stanford who wanted to do more research on the cognitive development, maybe decline of older adults, and he wanted to see, you know, would participating in a guided autobiography group, what would that do to the brain? I see. And so he asked me to lead groups at Stanford as a research project. Um, and I did that for two years. I had um, close to 200 people. You have to know what the outcomes were, what they found out. To me, I have my outcome. <laughs> the outcome is, is helping people yes. to tell their story, to reflect on the story, and to share them. Bond with other people in, in confident relationships. Look at events in your life that some of them are casual, mundane, but some of them are more conceptual mm -hmm. topics or, or philosophical topics. Um, this week with a group we looked at you know, how do we look at death and dying? Or how do we look at religion and spiritual experiences? And to have a very eclectic group of women around mm -hmm. the table sharing their personal experiences mm -hmm. was very, very heartwarming. And So if one of our viewers would like to join your group, uh, do they speak with you? Do they contact you directly? Or how would they gain entrance into one of your groups? Yeah, we can go to the website, which is storiesunfolding.com. Storiesunfolding.com, oh. one word and then dot com. Exactly. And then, you know, you, you will be brought to signing up to a class or contact me. Uh, you can call me. I don't know if, you know, you want a phone number. You can email, email me, Gab Groups at yahoo.com. Gab groups at yahoo.com. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on our show. I really appreciate it. And My pleasure. And learned a lot about gerontology that I never knew before and some yeah. new, very innovative ways of using that discipline. Thank you so thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you so much for being on our show today and sharing some insights of how various aspects of gerontology can be applied to daily life. Also, I would like to invite our TV viewers to join us and become members of The Better Part. Visitors are always welcome to attend our meetings held at 9.30 a.m. on Tuesdays at the Cupertino Senior Center. If you are interested in becoming a Better Part member, please contact the Senior Center for more information or simply attend one of our meetings. Thank you.